blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James J. Kaprash. On my way to Israel, but appropriately speaking to you from Great Britain, from England at the moment. What we are looking at is God save the Queen, the crisis in the British monarchy. It may not seem to mean much to people in other countries, but in Great Britain and in the Commonwealth countries, such as Australia, New Zealand, various Afro-Caribbean countries, and of course in Great Britain itself, it is major news. It has even reached coverage parity with the events in Iran and the American impeachment of Donald Trump and much of the international news media. Let's understand what is happening with the crisis the British monarchy finds itself in, why it's happening, and what it means. God save the Queen. The British monarchy is beginning to look very, very fragile. Its future existence and the nature of its existence is beginning to become questioned, even by members of the monarchy itself. Even by members of the royal family, there are questions and there are doubts. It is not easy for people who did not grow up in Great Britain and were not educated in its school systems to understand the nature of the monarchy and what it means and what it does not mean. The monarchy has essentially deteriorated in importance since the time of Queen Victoria. The monarch has become the titular head of the Church of England and the figurehead of a constitutional parliamentary democracy, of a, or known as a constitutional monarchy, a non-Republican democracy. This is the nature of the monarchy. It also preserves the heritage of the people in both the union of Britain, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and the heritage of the Commonwealth, that is, the former countries of the great British Empire, which still have certain economic and political relations with the mother country, Great Britain. But its importance has indeed significantly diminished, except for cultural reasons and for reasons of the tourist industry. People from Japan, China, the United States, Latin America, continental Europe, they still flock to London for the pageantry, for the regalia, and for the changing of the guard. They get their picture taken with Grenadier Guards or the Queen's Mounted Lifeguards to photograph Buckingham Palace, to visit Windsor Castle. People are still infatuated with this based on the history, and it's quite a tourist enterprise that has consistently brought in revenue for London and for England generally. So it is, but questions are now beginning to be asked because Prince Harry and his American wife, Miss Merkel, now Mrs. Merkel, have said they are going to step away from royal family duties and pursue private enterprise interests. They're also going to live in Canada and Vancouver and only live in Britain part of the time. So they say, this took place immediately after the disastrous interview of the Queen's son, Prince Andrew, and his involvement with the sex scandals of Epstein in the United States. It has been a horrific, horrific month for the British monarchy and for the Queen. First Prince Andrew, now, of course, Prince Harry, her grandson. It has put pressure on Prince Charles and on Prince Harry's brother. Nonetheless, we have to first explain to people who are not from Great Britain or from a British Commonwealth country something about the background of what's happening and what it means. Britain has officially and legally a Protestant throne and constitution, except that it does not have a constitution in the American sense. It has constitutional laws. 
The two most important of these concerning the monarchy is the 1701 Act of Settlement and the Act of Union, integrating the parliaments of Britain and Scotland. These are the two most important historical factors constitutionally. The Act of Union, establishing the United Kingdom, essentially, and also the Act of Settlement from 1701. The history is long, interesting, but for the sake of brevity, we can't explain all of the background, what led up to it. It involved what happened in Ireland with the Dutch invasion by William of Orange fighting King James, having to do with the power in Ireland. This took on a Protestant and Catholic conflict dimension, despite the fact that the Pope sided with William of Orange against the indigenous Catholic James for political reasons because of the power struggles on continental Europe between the Papal States and France, a complicated mess. While the Protestants like to celebrate the victory of Protestantism over Catholicism, the Pope celebrated the victory of William of Orange. There was actually a papal tertium in Vienna. They were ringing bells and celebrating that he won. It was really not as much to do with religion as history has made it out to be. It had to do with politics. But the victor, William, had no son. This absence of a son accounts for much of the history of what has transpired in the British monarchy historically. Crossing from Ireland into mainland Britain, there was a history of conflict between the dynasties of the Tudors and of the Stuarts, who were Catholic and Scottish. This was very similar to the War of the Roses with the White Rose and the Red Rose, the House of Lancaster and the House of York, only then it was not religious. The conflict in the aftermath of the Reformation in Scotland involved Mary, Queen of Scots, who was the mother of King James, who authorized the King James Bible, who was a rabid Catholic. It involved an effort to reseize the throne by Queen Mary, who was a Catholic, the sister of Elizabeth I, who was a Protestant. It led to the decapitation of Lady Jane Grey and her husband because the Protestants and the family wanted to have a Protestant heir to the throne to prevent a papal takeover. This became very ugly, but let's begin at the beginning of this. Henry VIII killed at least 74,000 of his own people. He was responsible for their debts. That was a huge number in those days. He'd be something of a a Pol Pot figure, in a sense. But Henry VIII was no Protestant. He was an opponent of Protestantism. He attempted to persuade Erasmus of Rotterdam to challenge Martin Luther intellectually as a humanist scholar. And he was given the title Defender of the Faith, meaning the Roman Catholic faith, by the Pope. Now, absurdly, this title, bequeathed by the Pope to the British monarchs and passed down to each king or queen as the defender of the faith, meant the Roman Catholic faith given by the Pope, but they still proclaim the monarch to be the defender of the faith. That is Roman Catholicism, but they changed it to Protestantism, even though that's not what it originally meant. It was rather ludicrous. Henry VIII theologically, was never a Protestant, certainly not an evangelical. But again, it was the same instance with William of Orange having no son. It was his lack of a son. He wanted to divorce Catherine of Oregon. The popes would routinely give people dispensations to divorce if they were kings or monarchs or emperors, providing it was in the political and or financial interests of the papacy. However, it was not determined to be in the political interest of the papacy to give Henry VIII a dispensation 
to divorce Catherine of Oregon. So Henry VIII then joined Protestantism, not theologically or spiritually, but purely theocratically and politically. What he did do, however, in breaking with Rome is he closed down the corrupt monasteries, which were essentially set cesspits of moral and financial corruption that beset all of Britain, particularly England. He also placed Bibles that were literally chained to, to the fixtures in the, in the churches and made the scriptures available to people to be read in the English language in the churches. This he did. But what he essentially did was prepare the way for a future reformation in Britain. He himself was not a reformer. He was simply a politically motivated monarch and a theocrat. He made the British monarch head of the church instead of the pope, meaning the Church of England. Now understand, in place of Christ, in Latin, Vicarius Christus, translated into Greek, is Antichrist. By New Testament definition, the Roman papacy, as we've often said, is an anti-Christ religion. The only true victor of Christ is the Holy Spirit. So too, Anglicanism has an anti-Christ spirit by calling the British monarch the head of the church. Essentially, it was Catholicism with a king instead of a pope. The pope was both a emperor, but he was also a religious leader who claimed to be the vicar of Christ. That was transplanted by Henry VIII into Britain when Britain broke with the papacy. We will keep the title defender of the faith. We will keep the title head of the church, but not with Roman Catholicism. We will do it on our own. It's like a kidney transplant. Rome kept one kidney, Henry VIII took the other. He claimed to be, for Britain, what the Pope was for the continent. Britain had always struggled to be free of the Holy Roman Empire, but now it took on an expanded religious dimension with Henry. When Henry died, a crisis set in. His son, Edward VI, was groomed by Thomas Cranmer, one of the Oxford martyrs, who at one point recanted his Protestant faith, but then recanted his recantation. He was groomed to be a Protestant monarch by Thomas Cranmer, the first evangelical Archbishop of Canterbury, as he celebrated in the Fox's Book of Martyrs, etc. But he died in his youth. This created a massive, massive crisis. There was a fear that Roman Catholic Mary would seek to take the English throne and re-Catholicize England under the direction of the Pope at whose behest she operated. There was an effort to stop this, first with Lady Jane Grey, who Mary would have decapitated with her husband in the Tower of London. Again, the Protestants and the royal family and royal court trying to stop a surrogate papal takeover of England in the aftermath of the Reformation. In Scotland, there was a ongoing fight between the Tudors and the Stuarts, which again had a religious dimension. The Stuarts were, in fact, led ultimately by Bunny Prince Charles, who was literally born in Rome, spoke Italian and Latin. He was a papal agent, and he came and he organized the Catholic population of Scotland and the Highlanders to attack England. The lowland Presbyterians of Scotland, who did not like the English, the Protestants of Scotland and the Protestants of England never liked each other because before the Reformation, Celts and Anglo-Saxons never got along. 
the Welsh, the Irish, the Cornish, the Scottish, they never got along with the Germanic, Roman Germanic Anglo-Saxons. Yet, the lowland, lowland being the south of Scotland, where Glasgow and Edinburgh are today, the lowland Presbyterians fought with the English and the Duke of Marlborough against Bonnie Prince Charles, ultimately defeating him at the Battle of Culloden, assuring that Scotland would stay Protestant despite the efforts of Mary, Queen of Scots, who was a Roman Catholic who at one point tried to re-Catholicize Scotland again. Her son, curiously, was King James. Not King James from the Battle of the Boyne in Ireland, but the King James who authorized the King James Bible, as we would call it. Another story. The whole thing was very complicated. It involved power struggles between dynasties. It involved power struggles between Britain and continental Europe. And now it involved religion. In the aftermath of what transpired after the Battle of the Boyne and the Battle of Culloden, a crisis got bigger and bigger and bigger. People were tired of it. Ultimately, England would turn to the Hanoverian Germans for a king from their cousins, George III being one of them, and it was George III who caused, caused Britain to lose their American colonies with the revolution. The American Revolution would not have happened had it not been for this German king who the British brought in. Actually, he was ethnically German, but the Hanoverians were brought in from Germany to try to settle this mess but it didn't work. What did happen, though, were these two constitutional laws. The Act of Union, integrating Scotland and England with Wales, and the Act of Settlement of 1701. The Act of Settlement of 1701 assured that Britain would have a Protestant throne and constitution. They thought that would settle all the problems, but it didn't. With the English Civil War, the Puritans came to power for about 16 years under Cromwell, abolished the monarchy, made Britain a kind of a parliamentary republic, and then the Scottish Presbyterian Calvinists and the English Puritan Calvinists massacred each other in the name of Jesus Christ. They literally had a Protestant jihad with Calvinists murdering other Calvinists, much the same as you see most jihads today in the Islamic world are Muslims fighting other Muslims. This happened in Britain. The act of settlement settled nothing. When Charles I was deposed, it went on for a while, and there was a reign of terror in Britain under the Puritans. There were good Puritans, and there were Puritans who were quite bad, who did some very bad things, including witch hunting and executing innocent people on the basis of spectral evidence. The Lord showed me Mary Jones as a witch. They actually did this. We've explained this before on other teachings. A version of this, of course, spread to colonial Massachusetts, to Salem, where based on spectral evidence, the Lord showed me somebody was a witch. And then the Lord showed me somebody was a witch, and they'd have these ordeal trials. They would literally tie old women to the end of poles in England, put them under ice, an icy lake. And if they drowned, it meant they were innocent. If they didn't drown, it meant they were a witch, and they would hang them or possibly burn them because they had witchcraft powers. This is what actually went on in Puritan England. The monarchy was restored with Charles II, but Protestantism brought no stability or peace to Britain. Never worked. Yet you have the Act of Settlement, the Protestant throne and constitution. Well, it gets more complicated than this, and it goes on for a bit. I'll just tell you a bit more for those who don't know. 
Some of you would know these things if you were educated in Britain or one of the Commonwealth con countries. You very well may. Finally, to make a complicated story simple, Queen Mary came to power following the death of Edward VI, who had been groomed to be a Protestant king. The docufiction authored by Mark Twain, The Prince and the Pauper, which Walt Disney produced into a film, is based on Edward VI. He dies in his youth. Now the Roman Church sees another opportunity. With the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, the mother of King James, as in the King James Bible, who was a Catholic, and the execution of Lady Jane Grey in the Tower of London, Mary secures power as an agent of the Roman Catholic papacy, determined to re-Catholicize Europe and put an end to Protestantism, particularly to what we would call evangelical Protestantism. She hung many believers, but generally favored burning them. She burned over 250 by most estimates. She burned the Oxford martyrs, Ridley, Latimer, John Hooper, uh, was killed by her in London. You can read the accounts of her reign of terror in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Now, again, this was not new. Henry VIII persecuted Christians earlier. Henry VIII, together with Cardinal Woolsey, is responsible for the assassination of William Tyndale, his crime putting the word of God into the English language. Henry VIII, again, was no friend of the gospel. He killed Tyndale, him and Wolsey. Wolsey was to him what Cardinal Richelieu in France was to Louis XIV, a political agent dressed as a bishop or as a cardinal. He's someone who simply used religion for political purposes. This was Cardinal Wolsey with Henry VIII, very similar to the relationship between King Louis and Cardinal Richelieu in France. So it continues. It was not new to persecute believers. King James, who authorized the authorized Bible, was responsible for the death of many nonconformists, of people who did not accept the monarch as the head of the church. They saw any idea of a royal papacy as being wrong. Again, if you were to translate the term Vicar of Christ, Vicarius Christus, into, from Latin into Greek, it would be Antichristus. They were uniform in seeing the Pope as an Antichrist, but there were those in England who realized that by transplanting this from Rome to the British monarchy, the British monarchy was doing the same thing the Pope did. They saw it as having an Antichrist orientation to it. They said Christ was the head of the church. Now, the Puritans, again, had many mistakes of their own, but King James persecuted and killed many of them. The reason that the Puritans came on the Mayflower to colonial Massachusetts was because King James was persecuting them. That's why they left England and came to Massachusetts. They were escaping religious persecution for being evangelical Christians, being persecuted by King James, who authorized the King James Bible. When you see the King James only people, they're very embarrassed about or ignorant of the biography and history of King James himself. Winston Churchill, in his history of the English speaking people, described him for what he really was, and many people believed him to be a homosexual. Be that as it may, and there was evidence why people believed he was a homosexual, but he certainly persecuted Christians. Who authorized the King James Bible? Uh, a king who persecuted born again Christians, who sent the Pilgrim Fathers on the Mayflower to Massachusetts to escape religious persecution and to obtain freedom. This really happened. Uh, tell that to the King James only people. In any event, something happened. Elizabeth I 
came to power. Elizabeth I came when England had a Catholic majority, where her sister Mary had murdered most of the Protestant and certainly nearly all of the evangelical leaders. Some fled to Europe, to Calvin's Geneva, and they brought Calvinism back to England. Calvinism came to Scotland initially through John Knox. Lutheranism came to Scotland through Patrick Hamilton, but he was martyred for his faith. When the Puritans came back from Switzerland, they didn't want the King James Bible. They had their own Bible called the Geneva Bible. The Pilgrim Fathers, the Puritans, the people who didn't think the Reformation went far enough, who thought that the monarch was not the head of the church, we shouldn't have a royal papacy, those people were persecuted by King James and they did not want the King James Bible. They wanted their Geneva Bible. Again, tell that to the King James only people. Not that I'm against the King James Bible in itself. Separate story. I only mention it in passing. But everything was based on these two constitutional laws that came out of all this confusion, all this wars, all this political intrigue. It was hopeless. Protestantism never settled the problems of England. It was never purely evangelical, and much of what was evangelical was corrupted by Calvinism, even to the point of having jihads and the capital execution of innocent people for witchcraft based on spectral evidence. Horrific, absolutely horrible. Yet, the Protestant throne and constitution. It was, in fact, at a later point, beginning with the Methodists of John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield, that Britain really had its reformation. Much the same as the Pietists tried to reform Protestantism in continental Europe, um, the Moravians, and the, the Moravians tried to re, re evangelize Lutheranism and the state churches of Europe after the Reformation because they said these churches had lost their biblical heritage. So too the Methodists became the Moravians of England. John Wesley was saved through Moravian missionaries and he did the same thing. It was then that the revivals really happened. It was John Wesley, George Whitfield, who were the real champions of evangelizing Britain, at least initially. The tradition would later continue with other figures. Nonetheless, that is the historical background of the relationship between the monarchy and the church in England. Elizabeth I, in the days of Sir Walter Raleigh, who was executed, and the Duke of Essex, who was executed, the whole story of Francis Drake goes back to then. Always conflict between Catholicism and Protestantism, the sinking of the Armada. The defeat of the Armada was seen as Britain being protected from a Roman Catholic invasion. Having failed to re-Catholicize Britain and Scotland through Bonnie Prince Charles and through uh, Queen Mary, who was known in England as Bloody Mary, they tried military means, but it did not work with the sinking of the Armada. There would be later attempts, as perceived in England, with Napoleon, to bring Britain back into the continental European fold. Well, let's fast forward from the time of Elizabeth I to Elizabeth II. Now, the 21st century, late 20th century into the present day in the 21st century. Let's understand what has happened. The Act of Union and the Act of Settlement are both under very, very severe attack. The reasons for them are being undermined. 
Most of Britain is post-Christian and neo-pagan. While Protestantism and a fear of Catholicism was again a cement that artificially held Celts and Anglo-Saxons together. That's all gone. People don't care about the Catholic Church or the Protestant Church, by and large. That is all gone. It is a post-Judeo-Christian Britain. There are very few believers in continental Europe and not many more in Britain, despite the heritage. Protestantism is a dead religion in Britain as it is in continental Europe. It's something that's simply dead. It's an artificial life support. It's finished morally. It's finished numerically. It's certainly finished spiritually and theologically. It's dead. Church of England is a joke. It means nothing except to a few people. But let's understand the reality of it. The monarch, as the defender of the faith, Prince Charles said, when he becomes king, he doesn't want to be defender of the faith, meaning Anglican Protestantism. He wants to be the defender of faith without the definite article. That is, all faiths, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, anything. He wants to be the defender of faith, a panorama of religious beliefs. He's an eclecticist. He took royal land from the Duchy of Cornwall that he owns and donated some of it for the construction of a mosque of which he is patron in Cornwall, England. A fundamental betrayal of the British monarch, of the defender of the faith, meaning at least nominally Christianity, initially Catholicism, then transplanted almost absurdly to Anglicanism, but nonetheless meaning something broadly Christian with a small c. That's gone. Prince Charles got rid of it. Totally got rid of it. What else was gotten rid of? Well, Queen Elizabeth II appointed a Roman Catholic chaplain to the royal household, not just an Anglican, but a royal Catholic chaplain. Again, this violates the spirit, if not the letter, of their constitutional law of the act of settlement. The queen herself has taken concrete action that went against the act of settlement, so has Prince Charles. They turned their back on the Christian heritage of Great Britain. Now, at the same time this happened, at the same time this happened, Scotland became more nationalistic. Although in the first referendum, Scotland declined to leave the union with England for economic reasons, largely, it would have made more sense economically had they done so before most of the Dead Sea oil had been pumped out and the wells tapped, but now economically it would be problematic for Scotland. Nonetheless, in the last election, the Scottish Nationalist Party and their horrible left-wing people, gross financial mismanagers, um, despite having Edinburgh House, Castle and Hollywood House, they wanted to build a new parliament that went 10 times over budget and it's an ugly monstrosity in the estimation of most people. It's just absurd. Nonetheless, they've made dramatic gains in this last election. Although Boris Johnson came to power in England and the Labour Party was thankfully crushed and Jerry, Jeremy Corbyn's anti-Semitic ethos was severely damaged. In Scotland and in Northern Ireland, the results were not so favorable to those holding a conservative and unionist position. For the first time in Northern Ireland, non-unionists have the electoral majority of seats in Parliament. 
between the Sinn Féin, which is the political wing of the Irish Republican Army, or the Irish Republican Army, the provisional IRA, it's not the true IRA, is the military wing of the Sinn Féin party, and the Social Democratic Party of Northern Ireland, the Unionist parties, the Orange Men, are now in a minority. Northern Ireland had been the only place in the United Kingdom and the only place in Ireland that resisted non-therapeutic abortion, same-sex marriage. Now, that's been taken away. Essentially, it's been taken away. The Republic of Ireland voted for abortion and voted for same-sex marriage and elected Europe's first openly homosexual prime minister, or Taoiseach, as he's known in Irish. Mr. Radiker, practicing homosexual. Northern Ireland was politically coerced into, abandon, into abandoning its conservative moral positions on things like abortion and same-sex marriage. And now they no longer are the majority party. They're forced into a Stormont government. It's Stormont Castle in Northern Ireland in power sharing with Irish Republicans who are mainly non-practicing Roman Catholics. That's Ireland. Scotland, the Scottish Nationalist Party is now the third biggest party in Great Britain. It has overtaken the Liberal Democratic Party. Traditionally, it had been the Conservative Party known as the Tories. It had been the Labour Party or essentially socialist, and the Liberal Democratic Party, who are also essentially socialist. The Lib Dems have now faded. It's the Scottish National Party that is the broker party, the third party in Great Britain that could theoretically broker an election. The only reason that the Cameron government didn't fall was because of, the, of, of, of an alliance, a coalition, made with the Lib Dems, Lib Liberal Democratic Party. That's gone now. Now it's the Scottish. So the Act of Union is under threat. Scotland has their own parliament. Northern Ireland has a power-sharing scheme in Stormont, and even the Welsh have their own of sorts parliament. Celtic nationalism has grown politically. The Act of Union is being undermined and it's a direct result of Britain being post-Christian neo-pagan. Protestantism is not there to hold people together anymore by religious and political conviction. Still there residually in Northern Ireland, but not to the degree it once was. And it's under tremendous pressure. Well, let's go then. So the Act of Union is dissipating, and the Act of Settlement is dissipating. Consequently, and inevitably, the monarchy is dissipating. But there's another reason. What the Armada didn't achieve, what Napoleon didn't achieve, what Hitler didn't achieve, the European Union tried to achieve, making Great Britain an offshore colony of continental Europe, of some kind of a reconfederated, unholy Roman Empire, ruled by unelected socialist bureaucrats in Brussels who they couldn't vote for. This was resisted by the British people by the hand and grace of God. When Britain was still remaining in the EU prior to Brexit, the monarchy was a powerful symbol of British sovereignty against Euro-federalism, against Britain being swallowed up in the EU. Because of historical reasons and the association of the monarchy with the British heritage, which included resistance to Europe, going back technically to the time of Henry VII and Henry VIII, Now, the monarchy is not needed for that. Well, 
What happens immediately? Immediately after Brexit, look what happens. Now, again, people from the United States or Germany or Japan, they think of the changing of the guards and the royal pageantry and the, the, the things of this nature. It's a tourist attraction. In Britain, the monarchy had one remaining political importance, one. It was a symbol of British sovereignty and self-identity at a time when the European Union was taking it away. People who might have otherwise been Republican flocked to continue to support the monarchy against the European Union political establishment and those in Britain who are a part of it or in league with it. The Europhiles. But now with Brexit, we don't need it for that anymore. It's one remaining political function of the monarchy as an institution was the fact that it was emblematic of British independence from Europe and sovereignty going back centuries. Now, post-Brexit, What's its function? It's simply a tourist attraction that costs the British taxpayers money. On the other hand, it does bring in tourist revenue. That's all it is. Now, look what happened immediately after Brexit. Immediately. Prince Andrew was caught in a scandal, an ugly, ugly scandal involving Jeffrey Epstein in New York. He gave a disastrous interview in which he almost indicted himself in the eyes of the viewers on British television. It was a moral indictment of Prince Andrew reflecting very badly on the royal family and the monarchy. Compounded by Prince Harry and his American wife stating that they want to step back from royal duties, they want to immigrate to Canada and only live in Britain part of the time and run their own commercial enterprise. Now, there are those who've pointed out that this is a global trend, not only with the monarchy. Prince Harry and his wife, his American wife, want to cash in on their family relationship to the monarchy in their own commercial enterprise, but not perform the functions of the monarchy expected of members of the royal family in ceremonial capacities and so forth, and as patrons of various charities and things like this, where they'd have to participate in all kinds of social and cultural functions. That's gone. They don't want to have to deal with all of the patronage to the same degree. They want their own independent charity, and they don't want to have to keep up with the royal duties, even though to some degree they will be financially benefiting when they're in Britain, at least, from housing, accommodation, and other things, private security paid for by the British taxpayer. The British journalist, Melanie Phillips, addressed this issue, and she pointed out curiously how it's something that's happened in other countries. Uh, Chelsea Clinton made $9 million because of who her parents were with no real responsibility. Joseph Biden's son, Hunter Biden, now in a paternity suit in Arkansas, was literally thrown out of the American Navy, thrown out of the United States Navy for cocaine abuse, for the illegal use of narcotics. Yet, he was allowed to be on the board of an energy company in the Ukraine that was saturated in a history of corruption with having no background in the energy industry whatsoever. His background was as a discredited and discharged naval officer thrown out of the Navy, essentially, for cocaine. Yet, made a lot of money because of who his father is. The British royals are not the only one doing this. I agree with those who pointed this out. 
Mel Melanie Phillips is only one of them. Others have thought along similar lines, and I do agree with them. Just attributing to them the fact that I'm not the one who arrived at this conclusion on my own. I agree with them. Nonetheless, here we have him. Now, the tabloid press in Britain has often questioned, is he really the biological son of Prince Charles? There are disputes. There's been no official mitochondrial DNA testing, no blood testing, but his mother, of course, Prince Diana, Princess Diana, had been having an adulterous relationship with James Hewitt, and there are those who claimed that he has the gingy features, reddish features of Hewitt, not the features of Prince Charles, that we know Diana was an adulteress and so forth, and that he may not actually be the rightful prince. That is argued in the tabloid press in Britain, whether it's true or not, without genetic testing, nobody actually knows for sure. Nonetheless, he is in the position of prince will continue to benefit from it by cashing in on it in his own commercial enterprise. The woman called Fergie, who was married to the uncle of Prince Harry, did the same kind of thing. She used her royal connections in the commercial world after she was divorced from the royal family. Princess Diana was able to keep her title as her royal highness, even after her divorce from Prince Charles. But with Diana's death, died the glamour attributed to the monarchy. There is no more glamour associated with it in England anymore. There was a hope that the two princes who are the sons of Charles could revive it. But thus far, that is certainly not happening, and it's particularly not happening with Prince Harry and his American wife. Well, let's go with this even further. The scandal with Prince Andrew. Now, what's happening with Prince Harry? The monarchy is being shaken to its foundations. Its relevance is being questioned. Some in the press, some who are pro-royal family, pro-monarchy, are blaming Prince Harry, blaming Prince Andrew for damaging the credibility and the potency of the monarchy as an institution. Nobody is telling the whole truth, however, that what's happening to the monarchy is a direct consequence of the United Kingdom largely being post-Christian, post-Judeo-Christian, neo-pagan. The abandonment of the Protestant throne and constitution, of which Queen Elizabeth II herself has been complicit in appointing a Roman Catholic chaplain in violation of the spirit of the Act of Settlement of 1701. It's supposed to guarantee that the monarchy would be a Protestant institution. She began to compromise herself. Prince Charles, not the defender of the faith, meaning Christendom or Anglicanism or Protestantism, but Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism. The monarchy has self-destructed. It's one remaining purpose other than tourism. has now become superfluous, redundant. Britain's sovereignty is not under the same kind of attack from continental Europe at the moment, at least. It's not needed as a symbol of British independence based on the British royal heritage of independence from continental Europe going back so many centuries. It's lost its purpose. The Act of Parliament, that was the Act of Union, and the Act of Parliament, that was the Act of Settlement, both of these things are being torn up before our eyes. And the monarchy is going out with it. 
We're told in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, that it is the Lord God who establishes kings and removes kings. He sees these things. But righteousness exalts a nation. Good monarchs bring blessings. Bad monarchs do not. When I think of Prince Charles, soon to be king, what happened when kings like Ahab brought the people of Israel after other gods, after the gods of the Phoenicians? What happened when kings of Israel began worshiping the gods of the pagan nations? Well, Romans 11, if he didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. 1 Corinthians 10, as always, these things are written for our instruction. What happens to Britain is the same as what happened to Israel and Judah when the king begins to follow and worship other gods. Prince Charles has done this. The queen herself, given place to Roman Catholicism. When we read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, the way that saved Christians in England were willingly burned alive rather than genuflect and worship to the Roman Catholic Eucharist as the return of Christ incarnate, seeing it as idolatry. They would rather have died. And now she has a royal chaplain who says the Roman Catholic Mass and worships the Eucharist in Windsor and in Buckingham Palace and in Sandringham and in Balmoral Castle in Scotland and the royal residences. This is what is happening. The result for England, for the UK, and for the Commonwealth is going to be exactly what the result was for Israel and the Jews. If the Jews couldn't get away with this, either can the British. If he didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either, unless there is a radical repentance in the nation and unless there is a repentance within the royal family itself. The monarchy is committing suicide. Suicide. God save the queen. Thank you for listening. <laughs>